Welcome to Learning with Lisa, Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast with Lisa Navarra, award-winning educator, consultant, behavior specialist, author, and parent. Welcome to Student Success Beyond Expectations, where you, where we bring you Sarah Glenn Denning. She's going to talk to you about the signs, the symptoms, and how it feels to have a visual perceptual disorder. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for taking out the time to really raise our awareness of how important it is for educators and parents to recognize the signs of when children are having difficulty really processing what they're seeing and the impact that it can have on them. Absolutely. Can you talk to us about some of those signs that we might really need to be able to see to help children? Yeah, of course. So um, when I was young, um, grade kindergarten, essentially through to grade three, I did not recognize letters or numbers. Everything essentially looked the same, especially like your D's, your P's and your B's, for example. They're only different based on how they are positioned on the page, whether they're forwards, backwards, up or down. Essentially, it's the same curvature of the letter. And to me, they all look the same and I couldn't tell the difference between them. You could tell me to write down a B and I would write down a P or a D. I couldn't see the difference between them in my brain or when looking at a piece of paper, they all look the same. So I went from kindergarten through till about the middle of grade two where I wasn't able to tell the difference consistently and it led to a lot of frustration in my education um, before I started in an EAP program. And even once I was in that program and getting the assistance, it was still frustrating because I could not recognize the letters consistently to be able to like read basic letters. I was still below like a kindergarten level in grade two. Um, and nobody picked it up until I was kind of well into grade two before my teacher said, um, there's something wrong with this kid and we need to do something about it. <laughs> and, you know, we're talking about second grade. It's usually about seven years old. Yeah. So what you're saying is now many years later, it, it's had a big impact. You probably remember this like it was yesterday, right? I remember cheating in kindergarten. Oh, yeah. um, that's literally my first memory of school is cheating in kindergarten. And I was terrified of my teacher. She scared me. She was quite, she retired after my year, thank God. Um, but I remember sitting at the desk with a test and all we had to do was write up the alphabet. That was literally uh, the test. back in the nineties, really simple. Now we can do it with our eyes closed. Right. And I remember sitting there and thinking like, I, I can't, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know what an A, like, how do you write an A? I don't know. Um, and I remember cheating because I looked, I was like looking around quietly, trying not to get caught. And I found the alphabet on the ceiling in yeah. the room. And I literally started transcribing what I was seeing on the ceiling onto my chest sheet. But even that wasn't right because what I was seeing, my brain couldn't, it was like switching it up as I was going down to write it. So it didn't look the same. The letters were wrong. It's so profound to be able to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to, I, I'm going to cheat in kindergarten and mm -hmm. I'm going to get creative about it. But when I grow up, that's going to be my memory of the beginning of school. And so that's how important it is for us to really know what these signs are when someone has a visual perceptual disorder. So talk to us about uh, what else? I mean, the same curvature of letters. So then it was confusing what letter it was, being able to differentiate between uppercase and lowercase letters. Were there any more signs that could be helpful for people to look out for? I was really well-spoken. So it's not that I wasn't smart and that I didn't know how to, to say it. It was that I could, I literally could not read the letters and I could not like, and I couldn't write the letters. It was the same with numbers. Sometimes, you know, even into my teenagers year, years after years of therapy, I would mix things up. So like a regular coffee at my job was a dollar 55. Mm -hmm. But I would tell clients or customers all the time that it was 515 because my brain could not keep it all straight. And it's worse when I'm stressed or tired or not functioning at 100% when my diet's not good, when I'm not taking care of myself. Okay. How my visual perceptual disorder affects me is worse um, now in my adult life. But I'm sure as a kid, because I was so stressed, I hated school. 
I, I was happy to go to school because I wanted to make people happy, right? I want my mom to be happy, like cheating in kindergarten. I also remember being like terrified of getting caught because I didn't want to get in trouble because I wanted to out of me. But at the same time, I was so frustrated that I could not get it right. And I remember sitting with my like EAP teacher and her being like, you know, what's this word? And we would go over it and over it and getting so frustrated because I could not, I could not figure it out. It's not that I couldn't see the letters. Is it that they always look different? So right. So that's a, that's a lesson right there. So for parents and for educators, let's talk to educators now. So if you're an educator, we all know that children, when they're tired, that they might act out or they might be sleepy in class. Um, but we also want to recognize the way that they are able and not able to read is directly influenced at times when they're tired or when they're hungry. So if this happens in class, Sarah, what would you say, what, what can teachers do to help a child still have a positive day if they're tired um, mm -hmm. and still be able to learn as much as they can during that same day? Yeah, I'd say like positive reinforcement and patience is key yeah. as much as it's really hard sometimes as adult when, you know, the kids aren't just doing what it is you want them to do. It's it plays a big role. Um, reassurance that they might not be able to get it today, but tomorrow is a new day and coming okay. back. Um, allow us to vent. I don't know that I was ever given the opportunity to actually like voice my frustration. And that's also a lie at the same time, because I know that I was, um, and I think mindset's a big deal. So for instance, um, once I figured out that I had this visual perception disorder, I was put into this program that unfortunately no longer exists. It got shut down shortly after I was in it. Um, but it was specifically for people that have learning dis disabilities that are on the same spectrum as mine. So whether it's like dyslexia or a visual perceptual disorder, um, it was one-on-one -on -one after school program. Um, and she had this thing called an, I can't box. And it was literally a Pringles can. And like, all I remember are lips and the words I can being written all over it, like snippets out of magazines, kind of like a, a collage on this Pringles can. And whenever I said, I can't, or I don't know, or something negative about myself in terms of like the work we were doing, she would pull out this can and I would have to say, I can into the can in order to like switch the mindset. And I can tell you when I was, I hated that box. <laughs> like, you hate that box? No, cause I just wanted to sit in the fact that I don't know and I can't and ah. this is hard. And cause it never seemed to get easier. Like right. I said, it was such a long process and I was already burnt out as a kid. Yes. Like when you're catching something like this at the end of grade two, I already have three years of school. That's right of being like frustrated and angry and like emotional. And I already have all this negative belief in my head. And now you're bringing out this can and telling me that I, I can, even when like at my core at that point, I didn't think I could. Right. And you're right. It is a long time. Three yeah. years is a long time. So let me ask you this. Would you have liked that can better if it said, I can, I will. And then add a strategy to follow with that. I think it may have helped. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's something to implement, right? Like it's, you're changing the focus to something else. Right. You're not just saying I can. Mm -hmm. Now you're saying I can, there's the mindset. So you're going from reactive to proactive language, but you need the how. Exactly. How am I going to achieve that can? Mm -hmm. And so I, I have to extract this as a little lesson because that's what we're all about. That's Henry back there. And he teaches all about um, I can and I will, I will, and oftentimes the children I work with, I will use my tools. Now the tools have action strategies on them, mm -hmm. but someone who has visual perceptual disorder, yes, I think the mindset is really important, but these specific strategies in how to help with your processing has to be coupled with that mindset. Am I right with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So talk to me about um, some specific strategies that can help our listeners today. Yeah, so I think that is definitely one that we've just talked about. Yep. In terms of like shifting the mindset and just like putting an action step on that is the how. And the other thing that was coming to me, and I'm sorry, it's just like left my brain. Oh, is like celebrating when you have a win. Ah, 
So like when you get it right, you need to like take a moment and even if it's just a split second, it doesn't have to be like an actual like physical reward or something, but like taking that moment to like do a happy dance in the chair because you got it this time. Yes. And reprogramming that piece of like, I can't and this belief that I can't into I just did. Okay. So then what, let me ask you this. Were you able to do that at that time? Did you I don't know? remember doing it. No, but there was probably know? like a moment where she said like, you got it. Congrats. Yeah. But it. I think it needs to be like, just like that touch more, like that intentional and yes. repetitive, like every time they get it, you need to have like a mini celebration. And then you do that back. now? When you say 155 instead of 115? <laughs> what was that? At six years old, I celebrate everything that I do. So I now work in automation, business automations. And every time an automation works and it goes right, I literally have a happy dance. Great. So All the time. you had that happy dance. Let me ask you this. Um, with that happy dance, do you label it with words? Like what you just did? I can't say that I do. No, I'm just like, I'm just like, yes, it worked. Okay. <laughs> like, All right. You got it. Now on to the next one. Like, let's do like, and it just like propels that, like moving through it. Because when you have a day when like, and in my business now, when I have a day when I am fighting with technology and nothing is working and I'm missing part of the code, it's frustrating and it takes, it drains your energy. But as soon as I like realize I was just missing a check mark in the code strip and then it works, it's like, yes. And then we have to rebuild up that positive energy that I actually can do this. Yeah. And then it's, it, it works. And that's awesome. I bet I'm going to challenge you and I want you to come back, Sarah. Um, mm -hmm. Next time you do that happy dance, you contact me and you let me know if in your mind you labeled it with a word. Oh, it was just a check mark. Let me take a deep breath, replenish, and move on. I bet you you're doing more self talk than you realize. Mm -hmm. And that's and the reason why I bring that up is because when we're in the classroom, we need to teach children to label how they're feeling for that happy dance. Okay, why are you so happy? What did you do? And how do you feel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And I bet you're doing that now. You're an inspiration for what we need when kids <laughs> struggle in the classroom. That's mm -hmm. great. It's awesome. Thank you. So talk to us more. What comes to mind? What do you need? What do you think people need to know about this? I just think they need to recognize it. And I know saying that is really hard because it's kids are so mysterious because I also didn't want anyone to know that I was struggling because I wanted them to be proud of me. And I think it comes down to having those like intentional conversations with them. And if you're like an educator and you have a kid that is like consistently not improving you know like their test scores at the beginning of the year aren't great and their test scores at christmas still aren't great there's something going on there and it's not that they're being lazy and you know sometimes it's there's something going on in their home life but maybe it's that their brain just actually isn't connecting mm -hmm. and maybe we need to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one chat with that kid yeah um yeah. i know like for me why wasn't it caught in grade one like for instance, right? Because kindergarten, it's, it's kindergarten. Why wasn't it caught in grade one? Well, I had two teachers. They were both on a part-time. So they worked like, oh. they worked full day and then we'd have a different teacher the next day or the next week. I can't remember exactly how it worked. Right. Right. So there wasn't a hundred percent eyes on me. Mm -hmm. They were split eyes. So they weren't, they didn't catch what was happening behind the scenes because it was a split class with two teachers in one full class. Um, so like, I can assume that that's why it wasn't caught because there wasn't consistency in the teaching that was happening in the classroom. Consistency is very important. And what about consistency and openness with the parent? How did your parents work with the schools? Uh, so my parents definitely advocated for me in the school and I'm very grateful to them, um, especially after what I put them through uh -huh. as a result of, of everything that happened. But um, yeah, they definitely like pushed the school for everything. They were also lost. So also for educators, like the parents don't know. Yeah. Um, my mom had no idea how she knew she wanted to help me, but she didn't know what to do. And back in the nineties, we didn't have this wonderful internet where she could just go into a Google browser and type in like, this is what my kid's struggling with. How do I fix it? Um, it was actually my eye doctor. So I feel like regular appointments with um, physicians or other practitioners, it was my eye doctor that actually caught what was wrong with me and was able to give a name to it. It wasn't the education system at all. 
Um, and he was the one that actually recommended the program that I went into because the school system didn't even know it existed. Um, yeah, I think we fail in that way. I, I think here too, that we really need a lot more training in dyslexia, visual processing disorders. Um, we've we've learned a lot about a lot of different areas, but mm -hmm. I feel like this one, even more so than a lot, has been really kind of just not identified and, and not really just not identified. And then we need to take it to what kind of programs are we going to bring into schools? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's not identified. And as kids, we just learn to adapt. So like, could I have finished school without all of the extra support I got? Sure. I would have been fine. I would have figured it out. I would have adapted at some point. It would have started to click in different ways. Was it setting me up for like success as like an adult in post-secondary education? No, the extra help is what pushed me to be able to do the things that I've achieved. Um, so I think it's it's taking the time to really like getting to know your kids. And I know I'm like speaking to the choir. I know like there's 30 kids in your classroom and you're responsible for all of them. And it's crazy. And how can you like possibly have five minutes with each kid every day? But I think like, if you're looking at the grades that are coming in, like maybe take the extra time to spend with those kids that are actually struggling and that aren't improving. You right. know, I was right. the quiet kid in the corner that was saying nothing because I didn't want you to find out. I didn't want you to see me. Don't call on me. I hide under my desk. <laughs> like, you know, I was the invisible quiet one in the corner. The alternative to how you see it is the kids that are like the class count and they're noisy and they're disruptive and because they're having the same, it's just two different ways of seeing it. So maybe, you know, it's it's not punishing the kid in the corner, it's being like, okay, why is he like having outbursts? Sure, is it he's actually struggling with the, with the content? He's actually struggling and taking the five minute conversation to maybe get down on his level, you know, try and get him to like have a real conversation with you or me, force me to open up and tell me it's okay saying it's okay, be reassuring, I'm here for you, we can do this together, we'll exactly. learn about it together, and just showing that there is a level of respect, I think, there, because what happens is now, um, we have so many uh, dropout rates, the dropout rates for children who can't read are high, yeah. and it starts as young as children thinking that they need to cheat in kindergarten, because they feel like their needs are not met. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and they yeah. don't want to just, like, I, honestly, they don't want to disappoint you, yeah. And then you're not catching it. And then they're ending up in high school and then they're dropping into high school because now they can, right? Like that's how they have that control over themselves, right? Whereas like in kindergarten, the only thing I could do was cheat. Um, yeah. In kindergarten, the only thing I could do was cheat. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like there was anybody else around you that any other kids who struggled just as much as you? No. Yeah. And like now, do I know there was lots of people that did? Yes. Right. But back then, I was the only one. Like back then, there was probably a handful of people in my classes that were being pulled out for IEP throughout the day. And I didn't see anybody else getting pulled out. Even though it was happening, I didn't see it. So when I was getting pulled out of class, I felt like I was the only one. I was the yeah. different one. I was the one that wasn't good enough. I was alone. And I was different than my classmates. Mm -hmm. And I was also terrified that they were going to know that I was different. Uh, because yeah. I didn't want to be there. I wanted to, I was little. I wanted to be like them. I wanted friends. I wanted community, right? That's like the number one need we have as humans is wanting mm -hmm. community with others. And if they knew I was different, they weren't going to accept me. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how fragile children are. Imagine that. And getting pulled out of class was like, the big siren on top of my head that this girl is different than everybody else. Right. So what do you do? You know, what, what, how do we avoid that now when there's support services that are only provided as a pullout program? So in your opinion, what do we do to minimize that siren? I think we have, it's a conversation. Yeah. I think it's, you know, maybe when you first start, like pull two at a time so they can walk out of the classroom together. Okay. So it's not just one. Yep, and it's yep. having the conversation that like everybody struggles, right? You can't tell me like, I know even back then. So when I failed grade three, I did grade three twice. 
um, as a part of my journey, there was two boys that also failed grade three with me. I was just the only girl, but there was two boys that also did. And, but it didn't like, but we were never like allowed, like brought into a space together, just like the three of us to have the conversation that like, it's okay. This doesn't make you different. Blah, 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 blah. Right. I had my mom saying that to me all the time, but nobody else. Right. Right. And, and really, I think sometimes we want to watch kids' feelings. We want to make sure that we don't say too much, you know, and, and make them feel different. But the fact of the matter is, I think kids already feel different because they're too busy comparing themselves to others. And yeah, we didn't have social media back then. <laughs> like, right. So social media now, out. forget it. <laughs> they're comparing everything. Kids are harder on themselves now than ever. So having these conversations, these heart to hearts and saying, okay, you tell me what you need help in, what is hard for you. And this is where I can help. And if you need me to do something more, something different or stop doing something, you need to tell me because in this together, we're a team. Yes. And like, also like the importance, right? Like back then and even kids now, like I couldn't see how like this extra support was going to like catapult me further in life later, right? Back then, the only thing you're seeing as like a seven-year-old kid, the only thing you see is right now. You have no right. perception of like the future, the rest of your life. You're not planning for retirement yet. Like you're seven years old. You're literally just trying to get to tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like, what can we do in that specific moment? Right. Yeah. Like I remember, and I've got notes from like IEP notes from my help back when I was in school that I've looked at. And like, I was literally telling her that like, I'm frustrated in those moments, like frustrated that I cannot, like we're doing the same activity over and over again. And I'm constantly not getting it right. So let's change it up. Maybe like that approach isn't working. I was a well-spoken kid. So how could we use language to help my brain to move right. forward? I don't have that answer. I have no idea. I'm not an educator. I will leave that up to you. But like, how can we use my strength yeah. to like help build up the thing that I'm struggling with? It's using the, I think, in my opinion, it's using the cognitive skills. And if you're a strong speaker and you're very expressive and you're receptive, is what you hear is intact too. There's two really big strengths I think that you have. And so to be honest with you, if you were my student or client, I would work on you identifying your self-talk because in your working memory, there's two areas. There's the visual. So it's the, the nonverbal and the verbal part. The nonverbal is building pictures, which might be tricky for you depending on the curvature and whatnot. And also it depends on the um, pictures and whatnot. But then what also can happen is you could build the visual part as it needs to be while teaching you to listen to that inner voice. Mm -hmm. And that's where building on that cognitive skill of self-talk, tying it in with what you hear and what you're able to express, then building it with the other part. So for me, that's the key. While you are identifying the mindset and always checking in with that mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And I think affirmations, like there's a bunch of woo-woo, but for kids, like you see it, like the kids whose like parents are spending time in the morning and talk like, I am smart. I am like all of those I am statements, like bringing those into when you're doing the work. Like maybe when you're learning to read, what you're learning to read is I am smart. Because- because yes. so the smart I have, I have like this little funny thing, Sarah, you didn't know. It's, <laughs> I do not like that word smart at all because oh. yeah. And I'll tell you why. I think you might appreciate this. I'll mm -hmm. tell you why. Because when people, especially kids say that they're smart because they're able to do something. Oh, I'm so smart. I got it right. What happens when they try again and they got it wrong? Mm -hmm. Suddenly those vulnerable kids are in their mind, not so smart. Mm -hmm. So when we identify, I got this right because I did my very best. Wow. I'm so happy because I remember too. Yeah. To no, me, right? Yeah. And your affirmations, love them. Now let's add a because. So give me like one of your favorite affirmations. Uh, I am abundant. Oh, well, 
maybe you're abundant differently than I am. So I am abundant because, tell me why. Oh God, um, I am abundant. <laughs> Can you tell I've never done this because before? Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's great. Uh huh. I am abundant because I have a family that loves me. Yes, yes. Now there's value in that abundance. Mm -hmm. Now there's clarity in that abundance, right? Yeah. So we need to bring that abundance of knowledge to yes. our children as they are in our care, whether we be educators or parents, mm -hmm. right? And with our coworkers, we could do the same thing, but you just had a thought. What's your thought? No, I'm just saying it's so good. Like I, I love the add, uh, the addition of like the because like adding a value to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's deep stuff, but yeah. kids are deep. Look what you just said. You know, they're thinking at such a young age, okay, well, I'm five and I don't know, I'm going to go cheat. <laughs> you no know creative that is? Mm -hmm. That's insanely creative. You didn't break down and cry. You're like, I'm going to persevere. I'm well, going to make people was, proud. I don't think I was thinking like, I'm going to cheat. I was just like, okay, I need to write down the alphabet. And I just started looking around and then was like, oh, there's the alphabet. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. It wasn't like a cognitive, like, or recognized, like I'm going to cheat at that age. It was yeah. literally like, I have a problem. What is the solution? Right. There is the solution. Okay, yeah. let's do this because I know this is wrong. I know that. So like, I don't want this Bryant to catch me. So I'm going to do this very quietly over yeah. here and get super frustrated because there's a pole in the way and I can't see some of the letters. And that's oh no, not the pole. I remember doing that is because of the pole was in the way and I can like see this wooden beam to this yeah. day of my little self like right, like you're moving over around <laughs> up and down <laughs> and you still probably got that letter wrong all that work yeah most likely <laughs> oh this was wonderful do you have any advice for our listeners your kids will understand more than you think they do so don't tell them too much okay and that's that's gonna be i'm gonna add some context to that so um when they realized that I had a visual perceptual order in elementary school, the school people told my mom, the school board, told my parents that I would not graduate from high school and I would be a victim of the system. Um, Post-secondary school wasn't even like on the table for me. It wasn't going to happen. So don't even bother pushing her to that level. Um, and my mom told me at some point in my elementary school years what they had said. And that stuck with me. And although in one sense, it like propelled me forward because I was going to prove them wrong if it took everything out of me. I now have a nursing degree because of that, literally like my nursing degree was me proving the system wrong. I graduated from high school and now I got one of the hardest degrees that there are to get. However, it also affected me back then and it affected my worth. Uh, and, I would, and the other piece I would say is, um, part of my story is like, just because they're getting assistance doesn't make them less worthy of achievements as the kids that aren't getting help. That's right. Um, so when I was in grade eight, I actually was in class without, I wasn't using my IEP at that point. I had progressed beyond it. And I was on point to get the honors award at the end of the school year. That's great. And they decided that I wasn't worthy of that because I was a part of the IE pro e program. So my, and they told me, of course, because they have this weird thing about telling me things. I don't know if other kids have the same experience, but they told me and it directly affected me because no matter how hard I worked to, to learn better and do better and train my brain to do the things that it is supposed to do, it was never good enough. And I would never be equal to the peers in my class. Uh -huh. So needing help, doesn't mean that you're less qualified. It just means that you need help, right. but you're still capable of getting the same achievements that your peers are. That's very profound, really profound. Sarah, you have been insightful. You've been open, you've been challenged and having fun and I love it. You have a great spirit. You are full with a, an abundance of spirit too. So thank you so much for sharing your story, your insights and just suggestions um, to our listeners here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. My pleasure too. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast, where school leaders, educators, and parents meet on behalf of children who struggle with learning.